Yeah, great band, great great little tune. Oh yeah, that's sort of gold standard now, right? Sure is. Yeah, well, yeah, that whole ensemble and you know the listening to the trombone player again on that second cut. Uh, he's very much, you know, doing that kind of bebop thing. He's not doing the big slides and the big wah wahs, and he's just playing those notes. Right. Big, big, boop, 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 you know? Yeah, it's post JJ Johnson for sure, yeah. right? Where you play bebop on the trombone. Yeah. But he's very in control. I mean, maybe you have to be on that instrument uh, playing that kind of tempo or that, you know, that kind of music. But yeah. he's very. And then he has to solo after Lee Morgan and, and Coltrane. Shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You but know? He, but he plays very within himself, you know. It's very very smooth, very yeah. slick, you know. Just... It's Curtis Fuller. I mean, he's a giant. He's a legend. Yeah. So you know, we're getting to the end of '57. That was. I know we played some tracks from early '58, and um, you know, he Coltrane plays an album a recording session with Gene Ammons. Mm. Gene Ammons is you know one of the legends of tenor saxophone. Gene Ammons, if you haven't listened to Gene Ammons, go buy every record and listen to him now because Gene Ammons is badass, just yeah. super great tone. Totally in the you know he was in the Eckstein band you know so he's foundational bebop legendary cat. When they asked Bird what tenor players should we get, Bird he says Gene Ammons, the first guy he says you know what I mean because he's that good. Mm-hmm. So. Train's going to be on a Gene Ammons session. I mean, I couldn't wait. When I got this record, I was like, Coltrane on tenor and Gene Ammons on tenor going at it. This is going to be like, oh, my God. But Coltrane plays alto on the session. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Why is... I don't think he'd been practicing alto that much. You know, nobody logged more hours than Train on tenor or maybe soprano. I don't know if he was practicing alto that much. So his tone isn't fantastic. I mean, it's still trained, so the double-up ideas are amazing, the bebop vocabulary. But <coughs> timbrely, tonally, it's not the greatest saxophone performance of all time. Mm-hmm. You know. So why did he show up with an alto? Did Gene ask him to play an alto? Did he show up with an alto because he didn't want to play tenor alongside Gene because Gene's so good? I don't know. Mm. But that's what went down. And um, there's a funny record that he did with uh, Ray Draper. Um, the tunes are really hip, but Ray Draper's a tuba player. And uh, so you get these like kind of ofi kind of tuba solos on everything, which is cool, but uh, not necessarily the greatest environment musically, but Train really kind of kicks ass on that session. And there's another album they put out called uh, The Believer. Train's already starting to play what's going to be his 58th thing, which is the sheets of sound. Quote, unquote, sheets of sound. You might ask, what is that? Sheets of sound. It's like glissandi. He, Train was starting to practice out of um, harp books. So if you practice harp, not, not mouth organ harp, you know, harmonica, but, but classical harp, they kind of set their pedals in a way, and then they roll their their fingers along the string. Bring, brang, bru. And so Coltrane was practicing out of harp books, apparently. Really? That's the, how wild. Yeah, yeah right? Because it's a very good, excellent source for glissandi practice. And he hadn't now, met Alice Coltrane yet, who played harp. She bought him the harp <laughs> because he had been practicing out of that harp book for years. Hmm. So she bought him a harp. You know what I mean? Hmm. But the, I think the book came first. Interesting. And, uh, and there's kind of an angelic spiritual thing about harps and angels and, you know, mm-hmm. all that kind of thing. And um, so that's going to turn into his 58 Sheets of Sound thing. And, uh, yeah, so, and here it comes. He's going to get his old job back in February. You know, with Miles. Miles is going to call him back. Wow. Oh, heard, heard you're sober now. Heard you're kicking some ass. Heard you're recording sessions with my guys. <laughs> right? Right. Wow. Okay. Well, uh, that's going to be uh, where we're going to leave it for now. Um, uh, in episode three, 
is when he returns to playing with uh, Miles Davis. So um, the uh, w- one thing I wanted to talk about before we exit here is uh, that uh, you're going to be providing these transcriptions, and, and you've got Blue Train as one of the uh, transcriptions we're offering, and that's in all relevant keys, huh? That's right. So um, if you check out the Patreon, uh, you can get uh, uh, th- those transcriptions and um, <clears throat> a lot of other um, transcriptions coming along as well. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that'll be great to, uh, like you said, that's, a, that's a, a key piece of music for any uh, jazz student uh, or uh, jazz professional mastering their craft. Um, and, uh, so go over to Patreon to check that out and, uh, we'll be coming up with episode three shortly and we'll just keep, uh, moving along through the incredible virtuoso, uh, John Coltrane. Yeah, man. All right. Thank you, Timo. And I will see you next time and we'll get into, um, I guess we're we're still in the late fifties, but we'll be getting into the late fifties, early sixties, and uh, uh, the the uh, milestone collaborations between Miles Davis and John Coltrane on an album called Milestones. So until yeah, then, man. all right. Thanks. Enjoyed it. Thank all you, right. Ethan. Talk to you later. <laughs>